our reading this morning is from the book of Genesis. Then God said, let us make humans in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humans in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, see, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished in all their multitude. On the sixth day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from the work that God had done in creation. This is the word of God for all God's people. And let's pray together. Holy One, open up our hearts to your presence in our midst that we may be open to your word. This we pray by the Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. So this passage that I just read looks at the sixth and seventh day in the first creation story. We might call this the first and best weekend ever. The story begins with the words, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the term, the heavens and the earth, is a way of saying everything. God created everything. And this begins a beautiful and poetic series of verses where God creates light, and then the seas, and the sky, and the land, the sun, and the moon, and the stars, all the plants, all the creatures of the sea, and the land, finally creating humanity. And after each step, God declares that what God has created to be good. And finally, God declares the whole of creation to be very good. So God created everything, and everything is good very good. I considered reading the whole passage this morning, and and maybe I should have, but it's quite long, and it's so famous um, that I'm sure most of you know it or have read it. And it's such a famous and beautiful passage that when astronauts from Earth first orbited the moon on the Apollo 8 spacecraft on Christmas Eve of 1968, what they read in a message to the people on Earth were the first verses of Genesis. And they said these words, and they also sent home pictures of the earth, the earth rise. And the earth rise is what we call it when we see the earth rising over the horizon of the moon. And this is a very famous picture. You can find it on your phone in a couple of seconds. But at the time, it was something that nobody had ever experienced. And in that moment, they were gifted with the view of the whole earth as one. Our planet was so small in their field of vision that one of the astronauts, Jim Lovell, writing in a a memoir, said he could hold his thumb up and completely block the Earth from his vision. And so what does it do to somebody to see the home of everything and everyone that has ever existed throughout all the course of history reduced to a small blue circle no greater than the end of your thumb? Some people who have been granted the privilege of seeing the entire earth all at once have been deeply moved by the experience. 
And these are moments of profound awe. Seeing the earth as a beautiful blue jewel against the blanket of the stars is to finally grasp uh, the precious and vulnerable nature of our home, a small, beautiful oasis sent against, set up against the vastness of space. And some folks who see this were transformed, and they began to understand the beauty and the sacredness of all of the very good earth. Now, the passage that we read today is about how humans are invited to see all of creation and how we are to relate to it. The repeating poetry of the first part of the chapter is just so lovely. God says, let there be something, something is created, and God calls it good over and over again. But things begin to get complicated with the creation of humanity. God creates humanity in God's image and says, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps along the earth. God says this a second time and even more powerfully this time adding that we are supposed to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. These words make this a very difficult text. Because when we interpret these words in a superficial way, they suggest that the earth is ours to do with as we please. And certainly, throughout history, we have often acted like the only value of the earth is how it can be used for our own human ends. And we can see the consequences of such an attitude in the widespread environmental destruction of the earth. We use our oceans as garbage dumps and sewers. We have agricultural practices that drain ancient aquifers faster than they can refill. We degrade topsoil that has taken millennia to form. We cut down forests. We burn fossil fuels, causing the climate to change for generations to come. And we grow and slaughter animals under cruel industrial conditions, treating them simply as objects to be used for our own needs. We do not treat them as the beautiful creatures that God has declared to be good, very good. In our human fallenness, um, we do not see creation as a gift from God to be cared for sometimes. Instead, we see ourselves as being empowered to do what suits us with all the things of the earth. Now, as we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks, to be in God's shalom means to be in relationship with the rest of creation, to be in relationship with nature. But a consequence of our thinking is that we see the rest of creature only as an object to use, not as a partner to be in relationship with. And taking time from our busy lives to learn from animals or plants or rivers or trees seems unnatural and even artificial to us. In our Western worldview, we're mostly oblivious to the inherent sacred value of nature. And this utilitarian view has resulted in wanton destruction across the face of the earth for the purposes of our own gain. Now obviously this is not what our scripture is calling us to do. God gives us dominion over the earth and its creatures, and dominion in this text is translated from the Hebrew word rada. Now rada can mean to rule over, And one common interpretation of this has been to see its meaning as to dominate. Um, And it's coupled with subdue, in which is literally translated, is is from the Hebrew word kavash, which literally means to put your foot on the neck of your enemy. Um, And if you've ever heard the the saying to put the kibosh on something, it comes from that word kavash. And so one could easily read this as telling us to dominate the earth with force and to do with it as we wish. But if you go more deeply, and if you look at the meaning of the word rada, um, which we translate as to have dominion over, it's also related to words that mean to descend, to go down, to wander, and to spread. So a better interpretation is to see this as going down amongst your subjects and ruling as an equal. Kavash can be translated as to subdue, but it has a wide range of meanings. And so a more appropriate translation would be to take responsibility for. And what this new 
I think better interpretation suggests is that our relationship with the earth and animals is not to be like a dictator, not to dominate, uh, but is to be benevolent, to be nurturing, like shepherds tending our flock, like a mother bird sheltering her nestlings. And this gentler interpretation is in line with our understanding of God's shalom when relationships between people and the land and God are in harmony. The peace of God, the shalom of God, results from living the principles, as we saw last week, of Sabbath and Jubilee. Principles of forgiveness, of generosity, of mutuality, of holy rest. This way of living and caring for the world through God's shalom is what Randy Woodley calls the harmony way, where we live in a community of creation, caring for the earth and living with respect for the rest of creation. And so this, pas this, this passage of scripture calls us to see creation as good, as very good. With every act of creation, God declares its goodness. There are no favorites between light or fish or the waters or animals. It's all good. And when God sees all of creation in its totality, he declares it to be very good. And there's, so there's something more that we get from the fullness of creation. Something more meaningful than simply what each part of it brings. And this is what arises from God's shalom from the right relationship between God and the land and the people, the harmony between all of the parts of creation and their creator. Randy Woodley writes that the creation account gives a sense of God being very pleased with her creation. Like an artist admiring her own work after it's been completed, all the parts of creation fit beautifully with each other. The most beautiful painting ever painted, the most beautiful dance ever danced, the most compelling and engaging song ever sung. Creation is the essence of harmony and balance. And the first week of creation is a grand picture of God's shalom on earth. Every part is connected to the others. Every part works in relationship with the others. The pause on the seventh day is not just rest, it's a joyful, joyful celebration. It's God's shalom creation party. The Sabbath pause, this moment of shalom, is what Randy Woodley calls the harmony way, the spirituality that is the way of life of indigenous peoples across the globe. As we remember this beauty, we also consider the brokenness of this world that we have already talked about. We live in a time of political and environmental and spiritual crisis. We know that there is not shalom until there is shalom for all. And we know that God has come to us in Christ Jesus to reconcile and make new, not only us, but all of creation. And we can see in the human story of Jesus' life his deep connection with creation. At his birth, Jesus was not placed in a cradle in an elegant nursery fit for a king. Instead, he was put in a feeding trough in a barn that probably reeked of manure. His parables and his, sail and his sayings were primarily centered on creation. They told stories about birds and crops and fields, about fruit and fish and water and light and trees and livestock. Jesus was a craftsman, a carpenter, and he would have certainly worked in the marketplace. Um, but he didn't favor mechanistic or legal metaphors in his stories. Jesus, the Son of God, through whom all was created, was most comfortable talking about creation. So in the wisdom of the Harmony Way, indigenous peoples see the land as sacred because it has been made by the Creator. This is also the understanding of the people of Israel who believed that their land was sacred because of their covenant with Yahweh. And as Christians, we should know this especially because our, our scriptures teach us that all things were created through Christ and that Christ is the redeemer and the reconciler of all things and through him all things hold together. Therefore, Jesus' incarnation is not just to restore our relationship with God, but to heal all of creation. Now, early Christians knew that creation reflected God's goodness. They understood that spirit and matter were inextricably bound together, and thus 
the matter that was creation was understood to be sacred. The Holy Spirit flowed through all of creation. And over time, influenced by Greek ideas that considered the body and the soul to be separate things, the Christian understanding of Jesus' mission of salvation began to focus on the human soul and not on the body or the created world. And this was encouraged when Christianity became the religion of empire beginning in the fourth century um, CE. The rulers of empires wanted to be able to use the resources of the land as they saw fit to use people as slaves or worse. This is not possible if you regard them as sacred. And Randy Woodley credits this Western way of thinking with leading to the idea of a disposable earth and disposable societies. But he says that the gift of indigenous wisdom, the gift of the harmony way, is what can begin to heal our world. So this past Wednesday at lunch, a few of us gathered in the labyrinth room for time of connection and reflection. And we pondered questions together about the idea of what it meant that things were or were not sacred. And folks shared about what was sacred to them and why. Some shared the beauty of this place. The sanctuary is a sacred place to many of you. And they shared about the peace they felt when they come together with all of you on Sundays, um, the connection and friendship they find in this community, a noticing of God's presence in this place. Others shared about works of art or special places in the wild that filled them with joy, and so they felt those were sacred. And some said they could see the sacred even in mice that were bothering their garden or just in the simple beauty of a tree they had passed by almost every day without noticing. And then in one moment, they were captured by its presence and found it to be sacred. In today's scripture, God says that everything is good. Everything is very good. Our stories and our United Church Creed tell us that everything comes from God who has created and is creating actively doing new things in the world. From this we read that all of life, the universe, everything in the world is sacred because it is connected to God. Now the wisdom teacher Richard Rohr tells us that we have to let of the old ideas that what is sacred ends at the exit to the sanctuary. If we are to live with respect in creation as our creed calls us to do, we must learn to honor the sacredness of the earth. We are invited to love creation as God does and to begin to see the sacred in everything, to see the presence of God in everything. Now our Wednesday gathering gave me great hope because I believe that if we can begin to see one thing as sacred in time and with practice and with loving open hearts, we can begin to see the sacred in more things and perhaps eventually in everything. I think when we dive into the water that is our life and we're figuring out how to swim, we can be fearful. The waves are too high, the current is too strong. We become so anxious that we can't see the beauty that surrounds us in every moment. And in this metaphor, we become so focused on the day-to-day -day work of swimming, trying to keep our heads above water, that we cannot notice that the water of our lives is sacred. And I think places like this sanctuary, or our gardens, or a mountaintop, I think these sacred places are sort of like spiritual water wings that allow us to relax and to see the sacred despite the busyness and the chaos of our lives. Sacred places are warm, gentle pools where we relax and splash around a bit, letting ourselves begin to feel at home with a new way of seeing. Now we aren't all able to fly to the moon and see what the whole earth looks like in a single life-changing moment. But I invite you to try to change, even a little bit today, how you see the world around you. Greet a stranger like they are a friend you have not yet met. See a tree for the beautiful gift it is and how its mere presence blesses you. Listen to the birds in the trees and sing back to them. Walk gently on the earth as though your feet are kissing the ground. Just take a little time each day to pause and to appreciate this earth for what it is, a great and precious gift to be cherished. 
And if we are patient with ourselves, and if we are gentle with ourselves in time, with practice, and with open, loving hearts, I believe our understanding of what is sacred can grow until it includes all of God's very good creation. So I'll finish with some words from Randy Woodley. And he writes, We should try to see the world through the eyes of the one who created it. All the earth is sacred. It seems quite foolish that only after we have gone too far will we realize that no amount of capital gains, no particular economic system, no bonded convenience will be worth the price we will be forced to pay. He shares a Cree proverb that says, only when the last tree has died and the last river been poisoned and the last fish been caught will we realize we cannot eat money. May these words awaken our hearts and help us to love and to care for God's world. Amen.